Hello, welcome back. Uh, we are going into chapter three of Materials Kinetics, which is on fixed laws of diffusion. So let me share my screen and I will bring up the lecture for that chapter. All right, last time in chapter two, we covered irreversible thermodynamics. This was Onsager's formulation of thermodynamics for processes that take the system out of equilibrium. And irreversible thermodynamics, as we learned, is an agent for the second law. Uh, it causes the entropy of the universe to increase, and it creates the thermodynamic driving force for kinetic processes that we are studying in this course. So the outline for today is to give a brief review of chapter two on irreversible thermodynamics, just to make sure that all of the key concepts from that chapter are clear. Then we will use Onsager's formulation of irreversible thermodynamics to derive Fick's first law. Um, using Fick's first law and mass conservation, we will then derive Fick's second law, which is known as the diffusion equation. We'll then discuss driving forces for diffusion, the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient, uh, interdiffusion, self-diffusion, and then finish with some experimental techniques for measuring concentration profiles. So recall from last time, two of the quantities that were uh, most important for irreversible thermodynamics were the affinity and the flux. The affinity is the thermodynamic driving force for an irreversible process. It is given by F, and it is defined to be how much the entropy of the universe is changing as a result of some change in a thermodynamic coordinate X of the system. If the affinity is zero, then there is no possibility of adjusting X to increase the entropy of the universe, so the system is already in equilibrium and no irreversible process would occur. However, if the affinity is non-zero, the result of that will be a flux. And a flux, in its most general sense, is the time rate of change of some thermodynamic variable of interest. Flux is denoted by J, and it is defined to be the time rate of change of X, the thermodynamic um, variable of interest. So affinity is like the cause, it is the thermodynamic driving force, and flux is the effect. And if you take the product of the two, you get the rate of entropy production of the irreversible process. So taking the, the time derivative of entropy, writing it in terms of the partial entropy with respect to a thermodynamic coordinate times the time rate of change of that thermodynamic coordinate, that's the same thing as the product of the affinity, which is the, this first factor, and the flux, which is the second factor. So if you take the product of the affinities and the fluxes, add them up for all of the thermodynamic variables of interest, that gets you the rate of entropy production for the system. Now, recall we made a few simplifying assumptions in our treatment of irreversible thermodynamics. The first simplifying assumption was that it is a purely resistive system. This means that the flux depends only on the affinities at the same instant in time and not going back to some memory of affinities at previous points in time. With that assumption of a purely resistive system, we can write the flux of some thermodynamic variable here, I, in terms of a Maclaurin series expansion where we have linear terms. So these um, linear kinetic coefficients here or simply kinetic coefficients are the proportionality constants between the affinity of the thermodynamic parameter J and the flux of the thermodynamic parameter I. So the kinetic coefficient here is Lij, which is equal to the partial of the flux of I with respect to the affinity of J. That is the linear term then there would be a quadratic term in our Maclaurin series, which has these second order kinetic coefficients and so on. The, the second assumption that we make is that of linearity, which means that we assume that only the linear terms matter the most. And so we truncate this Maclaurin series after the linear term 
and um, basically zero out the quadratic and higher order terms. The third assumption is that of Onsager reciprocity. Onsager reciprocity uh, states the fundamental symmetry of irreversible thermodynamics. So this assumes that um, the kinetic coefficients are the same with respect to switching the indices. In other words, Ljk is equal to Lkj. Um, so these three simplifying assumptions are the purely resistive system, linear system, and Onsager reciprocity. Uh, we then explored some applications of irreversible thermodynamics to different material systems that exhibit coupling effects. For example, uh, the Saray effect, also known as thermophoresis, uh, occurs in systems where an imposed thermal gradient can create a concentration profile. Uh, thermoelectric materials uh, have to do with the coupling between thermal and electrical gradients, so the Seebeck effect, Peltier effect, Thompson effect. Uh, another example is electromigration, uh, where an electrical current leads to a concentration gradient. We also covered some common flux equations that you already know from your physics courses. Uh, this was Fick's first law, which governs the flow of matter, Fourier's law, which governs the flow of heat, and Ohm's law, which governs the flow of electrical charge. You'll note that all three of these equations are mathematically identical. They all have a flux that's equal to um, some sort of thermodynamic driving force, whether it is a temperature gradient, a concentration gradient, or an electrical potential gradient. That thermodynamic driving force is multiplied by a kinetic coefficient, either the diffusion coefficient, the thermal conductivity, or the electrical conductivity, or one over the electrical resistivity. Um, and then there's a minus sign out in front because the fluxes that are caused by the thermodynamic driving forces act to lower the thermodynamic driving force. So all three of these equations have the same mathematical form. They are all uh, flux equations, and they were all proposed by these corresponding scientists back in the 19th century, which was several decades before Onsager did his pioneering work on irreversible thermodynamics. So even though irreversible thermodynamics provides um, a unifying physical basis for all of these flux equations, um, they were proposed phenomenologically just based on experimental observation by uh, Fick, Fourier, and Ohm uh, well before there was any formal analysis of irreversible thermodynamics. So the first thing that I want to do in chapter three is to show you how to go from uh, Onsager's formulation of irreversible thermodynamics to derive Fick's first law, which of course was proposed decades beforehand. Um, now, Fick's first law is governing the flow of matter in re with respect to a concentration gradient. So the relevant part of our um, thermodynamic equation for that is how the local entropy, ds, is changing with respect to local changes in concentration of species, dn. And the um, constant of proportionality between those two from your fundamental equation of thermodynamics is minus the chemical potential of that species divided by the temperature of the system. And therefore the relevant flux equation where we consider only one thermodynamic um, property, which is just um, our concentration, the relevant flux equation only has one term in that case. So the flux of matter here, J, is equal to minus the kinetic coefficient which I've listed here as LCC, meaning it is um, from the affinity of the concentration acting on changes in the concentration profile. Um, this will be related to the diffusion coefficient in a moment. So minus our kinetic coefficient LCC times the gradient of the chemical potential uh, divided by um, the temperature here, so mu over T. Now we have to make a couple of assumptions to go from this formulation um, to uh, fix first law. 
The first is that the temperature of the system is homogeneous. So we need to assume that the temperature is the same throughout the system. And if we do that, this one over temperature can be pulled out in front of the gradient of the, of the chemical potential. Um, the next assumption is to assume that this chemical potential gradient is entirely governed by the concentration gradient. So in other words, this gradient of the chemical potential is just equal to some constant of proportionality times the gradient of the concentration. Um, of course, in reality, there are other parts of the chemical potential that may influence um, actual diffusion, but in order to get fixed first law, Fixed first law is based on the assumption that the only driving force for diffusion is uh, inhomogeneities and in concentration. So it's the gradient of the concentration profile. And if you take whatever constant proportional of proportionality is needed to go from the gradient of the chemical potential to the gradient of the concentration, lump it together with our kinetic coefficient and our inverse temperature, then that is declared to be the diffusivity D, also known as the diffusion coefficient. And from that, we get this formulation here of fixed first law, where it is the flux of matter here equal to the minus sign here because the flux acts to lessen the concentration profile times D, our kinetic rate parameter here, the diffusion coefficient, which governs how fast the kinetics occur, times our thermodynamic driving force, which is the gradient of the concentration. So this is fix first law and kind of the steps that one needs to take to go backwards from um, Onsager's formulation of irreversible thermodynamics back to the phenomenological form of, um, of this flux equation proposed by Fick. Just a, a brief reminder here of uh, the math involved. We're using the gradient operator. The gradient operator looks like this upside down triangle here. And in three dimensions, if we take um, the gradient operator here acting on uh, a scalar property like this concentration, what this gives us is a vector uh, where we've got the partials of that quantity, so the partial of concentration with respect to x, y, and z, multiplied by the unit step vectors along each of those directions. So it's the partial of concentration with respect to x, pointed in the x direction. The same thing for y with the unit step vector for y, and the same thing for z with the unit step vector for z. So what the gradient uh, operator does is it takes this scalar quantity and it gives you a vector. And what that means is that the resulting flux from fixed first law is in fact a vector quantity because we've got the gradient of concentration that gets multiplied by a scalar out in front. And what we have is the flux, um, which is most generally a vector quantity. Now, the next thing we want to do is to use this formulation of fixed first law in order to derive fixed second law which is the one that we will be using uh, more often in this course. And fixed second law is based on a combination of fixed first law plus the conservation of mass. So to see how we can derive fixed second law, let's consider some, um, some box here inside a material. And what is the rate of material flowing into the box versus flowing out of the box? Now let's consider that we have a center point here in the middle of, of the box, which is labeled as X, Y, and Z. Let's consider that the box has dimensions where it's two times DX along the X direction, two times DY along the Y direction, and two times DZ along the Z direction. Now, it doesn't really matter which way is positive and which way is negative. All of these equations work out regardless. Uh, but let's just consider here that moving to the right on the x direction is positive. And the rate at which some diffusing substance enters through this plane, this left plane here, this A, B, C, D plane, the rate at which material enters through that plane and into the box is going to be given by um, the area here times um, this flux. So we've got 
uh, the area, which is two times dy. See the height here is two times dy. The depth here is two times dz. That's what's labeled here. So multiplying those two together, that gives us four dy dz. And now what is the flux over here uh, on this left-hand plane? We have to take what the flux is here at the center point, the x flux at the center point, which is this j sub x, and then subtract the derivative of that x flux with respect to x times the distance to go from the center point all the way over to um, the left-hand plane. So it's jx, the flux at that center point, minus the partial of jx with respect to x times the distance from the center to this leftmost plane, which is half of this width here, which is simply dx. So the rate at which the diffusing substance enters uh, enters the box from this leftmost plane is 4 dy dx times jx minus the partial of jx with respect to x times dx. That is material going in. We also have material that is exiting. And if we consider that it's exiting from the other side, um, again, it is the area here. So 4 dy dx times then the flux at this rightmost plane and that is the flux at the center point here, jx. And now we're moving in the positive x direction. So instead of having a minus partial of jx with respect to x, we have a plus partial of jx with respect to x. Again, times that distance to go from the center point to the rightmost plane, which is dx. So this is the rate of the material leaving um, through that x plus dx plane. So the rate at which the material enters and the rate at which the material leaves, what is the net change of the amount of material? Uh, to get that, we need to combine these two rates. So this would be the rate of the material going in, which is here, minus the rate of the material going out. So the rate of the material going in minus the rate of the material going out gives you um, the net rate of the change of material here. So putting these all together, this gives you minus 8 uh, dx dy dz times the partial of jx with respect to x. And you can see that this is because the, um, the first terms here cancel out. This one has a plus 4 dy dz jx. This has a minus 4 dy dz jx. Um, but these two second terms here combine. You've got this minus term here, and then minus times a plus here. And so overall, this dx gets multiplied out in front. You've got minus four of these, minus four of these. So it's a minus eight dx dy dz, partial of jx with respect to x. This is our net rate of change in this x direction. Now, since this is a cube in three dimensions, we need to do the same exercise along both the y and the z directions. So um, again, it's arbitrary about which way is positive and which way is negative. But if we have um, the positive direction here going downward, entering from the top into the box, the rate at which the diffusing substance enters through this y minus dy plane would be the area of this plane. So that's just 2dx times 2dz. So that's 4dx dz times then the flux at that plane. So this would be the flux at the center point here, jy along the y direction, minus the derivative of that with respect to y times the distance to get from the center point to this upper plane. So it's minus the partial of jy with respect to y times dy. That's the rate of entering from the top. Um, now the rate of the material exiting from the bottom, same type of exercise, it's the area here, times jy, and now plus partial of jy with respect to y times dy. To get the net rate of material change as a result of um, flux along the y direction, we take the incoming rate minus the outgoing rate, and then the combined rate is simply minus 8 dx dy dz, partial of jy with respect to y. Same exercise for the z direction. Now we've got material coming from out in front, 
into the cube. Uh, this is our rate at which the diffusing substance enters through that plane. Likewise, we have the rate um, at which the material exits from the plane at the back, and taking the rate in minus the rate out gives us the net rate or the combined rate, which in this case is minus 8 dx dy dz, partial of jz with respect to z. So now we've got the contributions from the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. And the total rate of change then going into or out of this entire cube along all three directions means that we have to combine all of these together. So um, in each case, there was the same prefactor of minus 8 dx dy dz. We had this partial of jx with respect to x in the x direction with respect to the y direction here and with, with respect to the z direction. So adding them all up, this, this gets us our uh, combined rate. Uh, now, what do we also know? We also know that the rate at which the diffusing substance increases must also be equal to the total volume of this box times the time rate of change of the concentration. So the total volume of this box is 2dx times 2dy times 2dz. So it's 8dx dy dz times the time rate of change of the concentration. And so these two equations here must be equal to each other. And so we set them equal to each other. And when we do that, you notice that there's the common factors here of 8dx dy dz. So this 8dx dy dz cancels the same factor on the other side. And what we have now is the partial of the concentration with respect to um, uh, time is equal to minus, and then the summation of all of these um, partials of the flux with respect to um, their own directions. And we can take this right-hand side, pull it over to the left where the minus sign turns into a plus sign, and then the equation is set equal to zero. So this is our result from that conservation analysis. Now what we need to do is apply fix first law, where from fix first law, the flux in the x direction is equal to minus the diffusion coefficient times the concentration profile in the x direction. The um, flux in the y direction is minus the diffusion coefficient times the concentration profile in the y direction. And analogously, in the z direction, the flux in the z direction is minus the diffusion coefficient times the concentration gradient in that z direction. So putting using fixed first law and substituting this into this equation where we see the jx, the jy, and the jz, um, the common factor here of um, minus d can get pulled out in front. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the diffusion coefficient here times, and now you've got, see, the first derivative of the flux, but that's defined in terms of a first derivative of the concentration. So what we end up with is the summation of the second derivatives of the concentration with respect to each of the x, y, and z directions. So this is fixed second law. So we have just derived fixed second law using fixed first law and this uh, conservation of matter in terms of flow in and flow out of um, an example cube. So fixed second law is that the partial of concentration of some species with respect to time is equal to the diffusion coefficient times the second derivative, the second partial derivative of the concentration with respect to each of the, um, in this case, uh, Cartesian spatial coordinates. So the summation of those. Um, so if we write fix second law in one dimension, this would be the simplest form of fixed second law. Uh, in one dimension, all the y and the z terms disappear. And fixed second laws is just the time derivative of the concentration profiles equal to the diffusion coefficient times the second derivative of um, the concentration with respect to the spatial coordinate, which here is assumed to be x.
Um, another way that you could make, you could write fixed second law um, to account for um, inhomogeneous diffusion. If you've got different diffusivities along the X, the Y, and the Z direction, in that case, if, if all three of those numbers are different, then it's no longer um, a common factor to be pulled out in front, but those um, X, Y, and Z diffusion coefficients would then be um, multiplied by this first um, partial derivative with the second um, partial operator outside of that. Um, a more general way to write fixed second law is shown here at the bottom. Um, so this would be, uh, again, the, the partial concentration with respect to time uh, is equal to the divergence operator. This upside down triangle with a dot is called the divergence operator. And that is operating on, as you can see, the diffusion coefficient here, D, times the gradient of the concentration. This is a, a general statement of the second law. And another little math moment here to remind you about the divergence operator and also the Laplacian operator is that if we are in a Cartesian coordinate system here with three dimensions, then the divergence operator is something that acts on a vector um, it acts on a vector rather than a scalar quantity. So if you've got some vector here, f, this bold f, um, is equal to some u times some i direction plus b times a j direction plus w times a k direction, the divergence operator acting on that is taking the summation of the partial derivatives along these x, y, and z directions dotted with um, this vector of the u, v, w, and performing that uh, dot operation, you have uh, the partial of u with respect to x plus the partial of v with respect to y plus the partial of w with respect to z. In other words, you take the x component of the vector and do the partial derivative with respect to x plus the y component of the vector, take that partial derivative with respect to y, plus the z component of the vector partial derivative with respect to z. And the summation of all of that gives you the divergence operator. And the thing to note here is that this, this result of the divergence operator is no longer a vector quantity. It is a scalar quantity. There's no direction here. So the divergence is taking a vector and it's giving you a scalar. This is the opposite of the gradient operator. You remember the gradient operator here, this upside down triangle with a C. This takes a scalar and it gives you a vector. So what is happening here with fixed second law is that you've got the divergence operator acting on the gradient of the concentration. The concentration is a scalar quantity. When you take the gradient of that, that gives you a vector. But then when you take the divergence of that vector, that gives you a scalar again. So fixed second law is taking a scalar, converting it to a vector, and then converting it back to a scalar again. And there is a shorthand way of writing this um, divergence of a gradient, this um, upside down triangle dotted with the upside down triangle is divergence of a gradient. The shorthand way of writing that is this one here, this operator here, which is called the Laplacian operator, not to be confused with the Laplace transforms. Uh, the Laplacian operator is shown as this upside, upside down triangle squared. This acts on a scalar and it produces a scalar, but there was some vector calculation underneath the hood there in between. So the Laplacian operator is first taking the gradient and then taking the divergence operator. So if you take the Laplacian of the concentration, what that gives you is the summation of second derivatives of the concentration with respect to each of these Cartesian coordinates. So partial, um, the second partial derivative of the concentration with respect to x plus the second partial derivative with respect to y plus the second partial derivative with respect to z add them up, that gives you the Laplacian operator. Um, so for fixed laws of diffusion, we have the first law. The first law is also known as the flux equation. So if somebody working on diffusion just says the flux equation, what they mean is fixed first law. This is what takes our 
scalar here, concentration. You take the gradient of that to give you a vector, multiply by minus the diffusion coefficient, and that gives you the flux vector. Um, Fick's second law is also known as the diffusion equation. So if somebody says the diffusion equation, what they mean is Fick's second law of diffusion. Um, this takes the, um, the negative result here of this flux, applies the divergence operator to it, and then gives you um, the time rate of change of the concentration. Um, if we have diffusion in one dimension, uh, in one dimension, the flux um, the flux equation here is just flux equals minus um, the diffusion coefficient times the uh, concentration profile along that one direction. And in one dimension, fix second law, the diffusion equation is just um, the partial of concentration with respect to time is equal to the diffusion coefficient d times the second partial derivative of the concentration with respect to the spatial coordinate x. So Fick's first law is assuming that the only driving force for diffusion of matter is the concentration profile um, of that same species. Um, Fick's first law does not consider other possible sources for, uh, or other possible driving forces for diffusion, um, but other possible driving forces do exist. And they include, for example, electrical potential gradients, which can lead to electromigration, as we saw in the last chapter. Or if you have a charged particle in, a, in an electric field, the uh, Coulombic interaction there will be a driving force for the transport of matter. Um, thermal gradients can also be a driving force for diffusion, as we saw with thermophoresis or the Soray effect in the last chapter. Magnetic fields, mechanical stresses can also be driving forces for diffusion. So, you know, even though in many cases uh, diffusion is Fickian, meaning that um, that the uh, the flux of matter is purely in response to a concentration gradient, um, and we're going to be assuming that in chapter four. Um, later on, starting in chapter five, we're going to consider some of these um, coupling effects where the flow of matter is also influenced by the affinities of other um, thermodynamic quantities. Just to show you one example here on one slide, um, this is if you have uh, the diffusion of a charged species in an electric potential gradient, um, there is a modification of Fick's first law, which is called the Nernst-Planck equation. Um, and this is an extension of first Fix first law that accounts for the electrostatic effects um, of uh, with diffusion of charged particles in an electrical potential gradient. You can see the first part of the equation here is the same as Fix first law, but then there is another driving force. So you've got the concentration profile driving force, and then another driving force, which is due to the electrostatic interactions between the electrical potential gradient and the charge of the species that is diffusing. And when you sum up those two driving forces, that gives you the total driving force multiplied by the kinetic coefficient here, d, um, and then that will give you the, uh, the total flux accounting for both driving forces. Uh, the next topic is the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient. Uh, what we will see both with the diffusivity as well as many other kinetic quantities is that the values of those kinetic quantities vary by orders of magnitude with temperature. Um, this plot on the right shows you an example of the diffusion coefficient plotted on a logarithmic axis versus um, inverse temperature on the x-axis here. And what you will see is if you plot um, the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient versus inverse temperature, in most cases, that will give you a straight line. And that is what's known as an Arrhenius dependence. So anything where you take a transport property like diffusion coefficient, plot the logarithm of that versus inverse temperature, if you get a straight line, that is indicative of an Arrhenius uh, temperature dependence. So the equation for that is that the diffusion coefficient here, d, is equal to some prefactor here, d0, times exponential of minus 
some activation enthalpy here, H star divided by uh, KT. And you can see if we take the natural logarithm of both sides of this equation, we have the natural logarithm of the diffusion coefficient d on the left-hand side equals then the natural log of this prefactor d0. And then since this is the product of two terms, the logarithm gives us the addition. The natural log cancels out with the exponential. And we've got minus here, the argument minus h star over k times the reciprocal temperature 1 over t. So taking the logarithm of the Arrhenius equation effectively linearizes it. You've got the natural log of d is equal to our y-intercept, which is the natural log of d0, um, and then our slope, which is minus h star over k, times our x variable here, which is 1 over temperature. So we're plotting versus 1 over temperature, logarithm of d versus 1 over temperature, and um, then the slope uh, here would give you the activation enthalpy for that kinetic process, and in that case, um, in this case, for diffusion. The D0 uh, would be kind of the, the limit of the diffusivity and the limit of this right-hand term going to zero. This right-hand term goes to zero when the temperature goes to infinity. So this D0 is um, the limit of the diffusion coefficient uh, at infinite temperature. Now, how do we get this? If you've got uh, the natural log of the diffusion coefficient on the y-axis versus 1 over temperature on the x-axis, uh, you can measure the slope um, of that Arrhenius uh, line here. And that slope is equal to minus the activation barrier for diffusion divided by Boltzmann's constant. So take the slope, multiply it by minus, um, Boltzmann's constant, and that gives you this activation enthalpy for that process. Um, and, you know, playing around with this formulation, uh, you can describe the same curve in a few different ways. Um, the usual way is diffusion coefficient is equal to d0 times exponential of minus h star over kt. Um, one thing you can do is to pull the d0 into the argument of the exponential. When you do that, it picks up a natural log. So now you've got two terms within the argument of the exponential. And if we give this second term here the same denominator as the first, that involves uh, multiplying by, um, it would be a minus uh, kt over a minus kt to combine the two. Now the argument of the exponential is minus h star minus kt natural log of d0, and it's all over kt. Now, this looks like something. If you've got uh, Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of some quantity, that should be familiar from lecture one. Uh, that is simply the equation for entropy um, from Boltzmann. It's the equation that is inscribed on Boltzmann's tombstone. And so this k times the natural log of d0 is the activation entropy. This is the S star. This is a measure of basically the logarithm of the number of pathways for uh, the diffusion process to occur. So this K natural log of D0, we can rewrite all of this. So now it, this equation is equal to exponential of minus H star minus T S star over KT. This numerator should now look familiar with, to you. This is an enthalpy term minus temperature times an entropy term. In other words, that is a Gibbs free energy. So this entire numerator here is an activation Gibbs free energy or an activation free energy, which we can write as G star. So another way to write this um, equation is, you know, building this prefactor into the argument of the exponential, you can manipulate this in such a way that you can write this as e to the minus activation free energy over kt. These are all equivalent ways of describing um, the same process. It's just sometimes you can get more insights writing it one way versus another. Mechanisms for diffusion, where there is a mechanism one that is um, activated at at higher temperatures. So that is at, at a lower one over T. So one over T is the reciprocal temperature. So we've got high temperatures on the left-hand side. 
and lower temperatures on the right hand side. And in that case, there are two different regimes here where we've got two different mechanisms activated. They have two different um, activation barriers and a steeper one here at um, the higher temperature end and a shallower one at the low temperature end. And we can capture that by a summation of two different Arrhenius terms um, shown here. Um, now the next topic is interdiffusion. Interdiffusion occurs where we've got the diffusion of two different species at once. Uh, for example, if you've got a material or a system that has one species here, the blue species on the left, and another species, the purple species on the right, uh, the initial concentration profile of the blue species is shown here, and the initial concentration of the purple species is shown here. Now, after some time, there's going to be an exchange of uh, the blue and the purple species with each other, so this formally a uh, sharp barrier between the two of them becomes uh, this diffuse uh, this diffuse boundary between the two, um, where some of the blue atoms have um, diffused to the right and some of the purples have diffused towards the left. Now, this is called interdiffusion. Interdiffusion because it is uh, two species that are um, diffusing in directions that are the opposite of, of each other. And the key question with interdiffusion is, um, is the net flux of the diffusing species equal to zero? Um, if yes, what that means is that the two different species are basically just swapping positions with each other. Um, so the flux of the individual species, uh, we have JA, if we've got particle type A, JA would be equal to, using Fick's first law, minus the diffusion coefficient of A times the concentration profile of A. For the second species B, the flux of that species is equal to minus the diffusion coefficient of B times the concentration profile of that species B. And now if we have the sum of the two fluxes, the sum of the two fluxes is JA plus JB. And that can be equal to, say, the change of the number of A plus the change of the number of B divided by um, the area times the time step. And the question is, is this net flux zero? If the net flux is zero, what that means is that the total concentration is always the same because the um, if the positions of A and B are just um, switching, basically A and B are just swapping positions with each other, that means that the concentration of B um, is equal to one minus the concentration of A. So if you add them up, you always get 100% of the concentration here. So in other words, if you take the summation of the flux of A plus the flux of B, so we're summing up our flux equations, the second one here for B this concentration for B can be written as one minus the concentration for A. And summing that up, if that equals zero, how do you make this equation equal to zero? The only way you can make that equal to zero is if dA equals dB. Or in other words, the diffusion coefficient of A is equal to the diffusion coefficient of B. And what that means is that the interdiffusion process even though it involves two different species, that interdiffusion process can be described using a single diffusion coefficient d. So that is what happens if the net flux is zero. What if the net flux is not equal to zero? Um, the most famous example of that is what's called the Kirkendall effect. And this is if you take, uh, if you have a system that has zinc on one side, zinc metal on one side, and copper metal on the other side, um, interdiffusion will occur where over time um, the mixture of, or the alloy of zinc and copper forms brass in between. But the diffusion of zinc into copper happens. Uh, a lot faster, about three times faster, compared to the diffusion of copper into zinc. So you've got more zinc heading to the right here and less copper heading to the left. So there's a lot of vacancies that are being left behind in the zinc. And this um, boundary here where the brass forms, uh, it proceeds more rapidly moving into the copper side compared to moving into the zinc side. 
So if there is an inequality of the diffusion rates, then the next the net flux during the interdiffusion process is not zero. So in other words, if you add up the fluxes of these two species, uh, we need to consider separate diffusion coefficients for dA and dB because they are not the same since the net flux is not equal to zero. Um, an example where the net flux is zero would be the ion exchange process for chemically strengthened glass, such as the Gorilla Glass on your phone. Here, the initial glass is made containing uh, smaller alkali ions, such as sodium. That glass is submerged in a molten salt bath uh, with a larger alkali ion, such as potassium. Over time, the sodium diffuses out of the glass into the salt bath, and um, it is replaced on a one-for-one -one basis, replaced by potassium, and that is to maintain charge balance. Um, these are diffusion of ions, so diffusion of charged species, and in order to maintain charge neutrality, uh, there has to be a net zero flux here. These larger potassium ions have the same charge as sodium, but they're much bigger, so they don't quite fit into the structure uh, as comfortably as the sodium did. They want to expand the surface of the glass. The interior of the glass doesn't want it to expand, and so it pulls the surface of the glass into compression. So if you want to break a chemically strengthened glass, like Gorilla Glass, you have to overcome not only the intrinsic strength of the glass, but also the compressive stress profile provided by uh, this ion exchange process. Um, the last topic for today, or actually two more topics, one of them is self-diffusion. This is if you want to study the diffusion rate of a, of let's say an atom in a chemically homogeneous material, um, the problem is that you can't distinguish the diffusing atoms from the ones that are already there. The solution is to use radioactive tracer isotopes that have identical chemistry to the stable isotopes. But because they're radioactive, then you can measure the amount of radioactivity and relate that to the concentration profiles of the isotopic species. So with self-diffusion, what you do is to um, put a layer of the radioactive isotope on the surface of the sample under study, and then expose it to um, a heat treatment at a certain temperature for a certain time, allow diffusion of the radioactive isotope into the material, and then uh, measure uh, how much of that radioactive isotope you have as a function of uh, depth into the material. So radioactive tracer atoms can be easily detected whenever they decay. Um, emitting uh, high energy radiation. But it's important to choose the half time of the tracer uh, that is you know, small enough that you can observe it uh, on the time scale of your experiment, but long enough that it doesn't undergo complete decay um, before you have a chance to measure it. Um, so the key thing here is really picking out an appropriate radioactive isotope with a half life that is on a suitable time scale for the, the experiment. The procedure for doing tracer diffusion experiments is first to deposit a thin layer of the radioactive isotope onto the host material. Then you do a heat treatment or annealing of, of the sample at a specific temperature for a given amount of time. Then you remove thin layers from the surface, uh, either chemically or mechanically, uh, measure the radioactivity of each layer, and using the known half-life of the tracer and the time since the deposition of that layer, you can calculate how many tracer atoms are in each layer as you remove them. And from these measurements of many layers, the concentration profile of the tracer atoms is obtained. Um, then you fit that uh, concentration profile against a standard st solution of the diffusion equation, which is what we're gonna cover in the next chapter, chapter four. Uh, repeat the experiment for several other temperatures, and then having the diffusion coefficient as a function of temperature, if you plot the logarithm of the diffusivity versus one over temperature, that gives you the Arrhenius curve for the tracer diffusion experiment. This shows you an example. This comes from Professor Rudiger Diekmann, uh, who is now retired from Cornell University. This shows um, the self-diffusion of sodium, 
uh, using a sodium uh, isotope, a sodium-22 isotope, which has a half-life of 2.6 years and emits beta radiation at 0.54 mega electron volts. Um, you see plotting at versus inverse temperature, you get the straight line here. So this shows Arrhenius behavior and that uh, Arrhenius behavior, then the slope can give you uh, the activation barrier for the diffusion process. Uh, a couple of examples of other isotopes that can be used are silver-110, which has a half-life of 253 days, and rubidium-83, which has a half-life of 83 days. Finally, I just want to briefly cover some experimental techniques for measuring concentration profiles, since that is key to um, to determining the diffusion coefficient in a diffusion experiment. All of these are available in our Millennium Science Complex here at Penn State and the, the Materials Characterization Laboratory. So um, you know, any students who wish to learn how to use this equipment are welcome to do that. Uh, the first technique is called secondary ion mass spectroscopy or SIMS. And in this case, uh, a sample is placed in the SIMS instrument and a primary ions, um, a beam of primary ions impact the sample. They transfer their energy to the surface region of the sample. And that is enough to both release and ionize the local molecules or atoms for the sample itself. So the sample is being bombarded with um, an ion beam. It's releasing its own ions from the surface. Those are called secondary ions. Those secondary ions are accelerated into a mass analyzer where they are separated by their mass to charge ratios, um, which then allows you to get the concentration profile of each of those. Um, this shows a diagram of a typical SIM setup where you've got uh, high energy ions, typically several uh, kilo electron volts here. Um, those are supplied by an ion gun. They bombard the surface here. You can see the primary ions bombarding the surface, releasing secondary ions from the material itself. Those are uh, accelerated here and then separated by their mass to charge ratio. And that, that is what gives us uh, the spectrum. This is an example of some concentration profile measurements using SIMS that can be used to get the diffusion coefficient. This shows the concentration profile of germanium as a function of depth into the sample, fitting this to solutions of the diffusion equation from chapter four, the next chapter. We can get the diffusion coefficient here versus one over the temperature. Plotting that gives us a straight line and then the slope is used to deduce this equation for the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient of germanium. Um, another way to measure concentration profiles is uh, electron probe microanalysis, also called microprobe or EPMA. Uh, this is another example of bombarding the sample with some high energy uh, particles, releasing something from the sample, and then analyzing them. Um, the difference is really what you bombard the sample with and what the sample releases. With SIMS, we were bombarding the sample with ions. Uh, in this case, with EPMA, we are bombarding the sample with an electron beam, and what gets released are x-rays from the sample that are at wavelengths characteristic to the elements being analyzed. And then, you know, analyzing the um, intensity of the x-rays at different wavelengths gives us the concentration of the species. This is an example of EPMA measurements of the concentration profile of ion exchanged glasses. These show the concentration profiles of potassium going into the glass through an ion exchange process and then fitted with um, standard solutions to the diffusion equation to get the diffusion coefficient as a function of time and temperature. Uh, one final technique here is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, or XPS. This is based on the photoelectric effect. And in this case, we're bombarding the sample with X-rays. So with SIMS, we were bombarding the sample with ions. Um, with EPMA, it was with electrons. And with XPS, we're bombarding it with X-rays. And what we are ejecting from the sample are electrons. These are called photoelectrons because they were released by um, uh, hitting it with radiation. These photoelectrons are ejected from atoms near the surface, and then their spectrum is analyzed to get information about the elements that are present and in what concentrations.
This is an example um, that shows concentration profiles measured using XPS. Uh, this tends to probe much um, shallower regions near the surface compared to some of the other uh, techniques, but you can still get in um, pretty far here. So this is a bit over a micron. Um, so to summarize this lecture, we've covered uh, Fick's two laws of diffusion, Fick's first law, uh, which is called the flux equation, and Fick's second law, which is the diffusion equation. Driving forces for diffusion based on fixed laws are just the concentration profiles, but we know that they may also include electrical potential gradients, thermal gradients, stress, and so on. Uh, the temperature dependence of the diffusion coefficient is typically erroneous. Um, next lecture, we are going to actually solve the diffusion equation under different um, boundary conditions and different initial conditions and go through some standard techniques for solving the diffusion equation. So I will see you then. Thank you.